Hello and welcome to another comedian's interview for my blog and podcast, The Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 1,000 stand-up comedians over the last 47 years. My guest today is the fantastic comedian, Mr. Francis Foster. Yes! Hello, mate. How are you? I'm all right, mate. That was louder than, than I expected. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm good. good luck. It's great to see you. It really is. It's you, great to you... be here, mate. Great to you, always, you always make me laugh with your comedy and I'm delighted that you're a guest. Um, over the next 45 minutes or an hour or so, we're going to talk about your comedy career mm. and we're going to go right back to the start. And can you tell me, please, how did you become a comedian in the first place? Well, so I was a teacher. Uh, I always wanted to be a comedian. People always told me that when I was a kid, well, when I was 17, 18, that I should give it a try. Never wanted to because I thought comedians were, you know, sad bastards. I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> I wanted to be an actor, mate. I wanted to be like right. James Dean, sort of Marlon Brando, brooding esque hero. Uh, sadly, <laughs> that was not my path. Uh, and I was a teacher and um, I was quite not dissatisfied with teaching, but it wasn't what I wanted it to be. And right. I wanted something that was that allowed me to be more creative. I, allowed, I wanted something that allowed me to be more honest. I, you know, all of these things. So I started uh, on the comment on the open mic circuit. So uh, what sort of year are we talking about? This was two thousand and nine. I did my first gig, and I I gigged uh, sporadically because I was also an NQT, a newly qualified teacher. Um, and the fact was that trying to be a newly qualified teacher in a school that was also failing. She was in a very, very rough school in a very, very rough area. Um, and that didn't really work for me. I, I just couldn't balance the two. So what I decided to do is I packed up comedy because I couldn't, couldn't really do it and do the teaching to the best of my ability. And I was just really focused on teaching. And then 2012, I, um, I came back to doing stand up, and that's when I really sort of hit the crown running. That's brilliant because um, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, comedians I know who are teachers. The, mm. at, the, at, at the school where I work, the uh, original head of history there, he became a stand up comedian and he did uh, um, five minute sets in little tiny pubs. Mm. And I had to go, well, I wanted to go along and support him, but it was like the same act for the first uh, 10 goes. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm, I'm sick of hearing all this material, but it's so good and he deserves to win. Is that, is that how you started? You took friends along, you did five yeah, minutes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, coercing people. You know, well, actually, <laughs> no people who wanted to go. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, here's the thing that nobody ever says, admits, but it's true. Your friends, when you start out in court comedy, they don't go to support you. They go out of a sense of morbid curiosity to see what's <laughs> going to happen. That's what that's you know. That's what they're going for. There's not, well, it's not about being supported. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where was your first ever gig? My first ever gig was in a bar in Hampstead. It was a graduation of a comedy course. Right. And what happened was, uh, I, I, um, there was a guy went on before me. He's a professional actor called Brian O'Brien. Really nice guy. He went on and most of his mates in the audience were, were in the, most of his mates, most of the audience were comprised of his mates. Grant went on, he's a very funny bloke anyway, he had a great little set, he smashed the pants off it. I was to go on afterwards, the problem was, at that point, all his mates got up and left, and literally walked out, and so I then walked on to an empty room, with wow. about eight people scattered about, because and nobody watching my set. And actually, that is the best preparation for the open mic I could have wished for. Wow, that's amazing. And and that it was It didn't feel like that at the time, Rich. I'm gonna be honest with you. It felt anything but amazing, but yeah. <laughs> I bet you were bricking it. <laughs> oh mate, one of 
my mate said to me, the funniest thing you did tonight, mate, was me watching you backstage, just pacing up and down, up and down, up and down. Because <laughs> that was the funniest thing about your entire set. Wow, that's that is that is a wonderful story. So, um, uh, obviously, uh, did you just carry on and do more and more and more, and you gain experience as you're doing it, or? Uh, how, yeah, how I, you know, I can you... only gig uh, once a week because of the right. nature of my job. Because being a teacher, particularly when you're starting out, is really difficult and demanding. The hours are very long. Mm. It's very stressful. It's a very yeah. it's it's a tough tough job, particularly yeah. at the start. So what happened for me was I um I did that uh, I, I did that and like I said I, I couldn't do I couldn't do those two things and I couldn't do them well. No, no. So no. I, I used to I go up to Edinburgh and get a little bit of momentum going and start doing well, but then I'd come back and so that's why I decided to knock it on the head for for a few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I'm, I mean, you can do too much. There's no doubt about it, mm. but. Um, it's great that you brought it back in 2012. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. And then, you know, I decided to hit the ground running. I decided, like, the teaching went well, but it, it became apparent that it wasn't really for me. Um, yeah, so yeah. I started to hit the ground running. I then appeared in comedy competitions in 2014 and 2015. Um, yeah, yeah. And then uh, I started to break through into the club circuit in 2016 and 2017. And then I just started to do the clubs regularly and right the way through 2017, 18, 19. And then the pandemic happened. <laughs> just you to know. help everybody out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. So, and, and that, as for everybody, that changed everybody's life. Yeah, of course, yeah. Really horrible, horrible, horrible time. Um, yeah. So, Let's move on to competitions. You you came third place in the prestigious New Comedian of the Year Awards in 2015, um, amongst other comedy competitions. Describe that experience and what is your view of competitions overall? Do you think they're a good thing? Does it help the comedian? Um, here's the thing. The thing is with comedy competitions is they suit a particular type of act. Uh, if you have a more long form style, if you were more of a storyteller, if you're more, if you were less, how can I put it, club, as it were, it's not going to suit you as well as as, right. as as other things. I think on the whole, the comedy competition is a good thing because you get to do a, a gig in a nice room. It vindicates you. It keeps you going. It gives you a little bit of exposure. It gives you a little bit of a leg up. Um so yeah, I do. And you know, getting the chance to play a big venue like the Leicester Square Theatre that I did, or that had the or it wasn't a Hackney Empire, it was a Bloomsbury Theatre. Um, it, it was great, and that's where the agency CKP, who are now my agents, uh, they're now called Blue yeah. Hook. Uh, but at the time they were CKP, some uh, uh, one of their agents, Ali, lovely uh, lady, spotted me there, to, said to me that we're gonna take me up well. I went up to Edinburgh with them to do their showcase at the Edinburgh Festival. So it was it was really helpful for me. It was really helpful for me. That's brilliant. That's so good. Um, when you're on stage, how do you remember all your routines? Do you have a way of remembering them all? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I um, because my, my act has changed a lot uh, over the years, it's become more political. I, I talk about things that now interest me more. Because I have a podcast and a YouTube show, which has done very well, that has now become my main focus and my stand-up. I, I now you, I now do stand-up as more of a creative endeavor than anything else. I'm going on tour yeah. at the end of this year, but actually it's my, uh, I used to do stand-up as a way to earn money, but that was my job, essentially. And when you do that, and you're doing the clubs because uh, competition for the clubs is, is and to get those spots is so competitive. You've got to crush every time that you go on. So whether you're an actor, an MC, yeah. you can't beat anything less on a Friday or Saturday night than eight out of ten. You just can't. Otherwise, you're probably not going to get rebooked again. That's the way. That's the way it works. It's fiercely competitive. There's not enough clubs. There's too many comedians. So as a result, that kind of forces you. And also there's a little bit of cowardice there, let's be honest about that. 
into, into having a very mainstream crowd pleasing style that you know is going to work on a Saturday night or a Friday night. Um, and as a result of that, that means that you write in a certain way and that means you perform in a certain way and that means that you do certain things because you know that that's going to work to that particular crowd and you want to get rebooked. Whereas now, because I've got my YouTube show, what I now do is I write what I want to write. And I know that the things that I will talk about, you know, some of them may be a little bit more divisive than before, but these are the things that interest me. These are the things that I like. And as a result of that, um, you know, I still do well at gigs, but I, I would say, interestingly, I'm much happier, but I'm not as consistent. Right. Because before, I was ultra consistent. But the thing is, with being ultra consistent, it means that you're, you're not as interesting because you don't have the slightly rougher edges. You don't have those, those sharper moments in your set which could potentially, you know, put people on side people really love, but also maybe slightly alienate people. What's, what's wonderful, though, I find when I watch you perform mm. Is that you're? Excuse me. Is that you're extremely confident on stage, mm. which is extremely endearing and makes an audience draw into what you're saying, so you can you can then get your points across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that has come through. I mean, I remember doing the open mic and I was pacing up, and this was in the days of the comedy cap. I don't know if you remember the comedy cap, Rich. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah very much. So, by, yeah, yeah. We, you, Brilliant venue, sadly gone and run by an old Faulkner. And I remember back, uh, I was doing the open mic, and in, the, in those days of 2009-2010, um, that was a big room. And that was a big thing for a new act to be called Comedy Cap, new act to uh, winner of the week. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a big thing we wanted to do. And uh, I remember being backstage, facing up, <laughs> facing up and down, being really nervous. And in Ryan Yusuf, uh, came up to me, bless him. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Me, he went to me, uh, you're really nervous. I went, yeah. And he, and he goes to me, okay, well, what, what's your day job? I go, I'm a secondary school teacher. He, and he goes, what, do you work with teenagers? I go, yeah. He goes, what are they like? I go, oh, they're quite tough and blah, blah, blah. He goes, why are you nervous? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, well, if you look at it, of course, teaching, mm. uh, you have to get up and present yourself to a group of people they are students obviously but it's exactly the same with an audience you have to generate uh, um, a um, presence that you're there yeah. uh, but of when you're comedy you're you're, des you're you're trying your best and succeeding to make them laugh yeah of course absolutely yeah. you know so, 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 you know, you, 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 you try your best to make them laugh, but it's all about connections, Rich. This is what yeah, you yeah. Know, people don't really get. Like, you sometimes see comedians go on with, you know, great material or for whatever reason, and it doesn't work. Because if you don't connect with those people in that room, it's just not going to. If you're phoning it in, that's why this material stops working a lot of the time for comedians, because they go dead behind the eyes, because the audience can sense it. And it's the same that, with being that, a teacher. You know, if you're just phoning it in, the kids know, they understand that. So they don't connect with you. So that's really that, what it comes down to a lot of the time. That's fascinating because because I've seen so many comedians over the years, um, I spot that as well. Um, yeah. I, I, my, my, my blog is very positive because I because if nothing else, uh, the, 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 the comics getting up and having a go, but I can tell because I've seen so many of them when they are a cut above the rest. And it's fascinating how you describe that because I think I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and look, and you know, and it happens to a lot of people and a lot of people yeah. make that mistake and you know, they've got bills to pay and it's difficult. But also as well, you've got to keep updating your material because if you're not in the moment, if you don't feel, you know, fresh and alive, if you're not talking about things that you're interested in, passionate about, it's going to come yeah. across. It, it just yeah, is. Yeah. And it's much better that, you know, that you talk about stuff that you feel passionate about, that you're interested in, whatever that is, because eventually 
you're going to work out a way to make that funny and really funny. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to make a much more interesting comedian. That's brilliant. Um, do you uh, cope with any nerves when you're on stage? Do you get nervous at all before you go on? No, I don't really get nervous anymore. What I, what I need to work on and what I need to improve is sticking to... I need to get more used to silence. I'm not good enough at that yet. Right. So, you know, because part of it is the ego of a comedian, you know, you always want to crush, destroy, blah, 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 blah. You know, eventually that becomes a crutch. And the very best comedians are the ones who are not reliant on the audience. You know, they have something that they want to do. Like, if you think about, you know, the real, you know, who are the true, you know, firebrands or heroes of comedy for me, you know, it's someone like Bill Hicks or Richard Pryor or yeah, yeah. You know, you know, these people. You know, they weren't scared to, be, you know, to have silence. They weren't scared to fail. They weren't scared to not have a good gig. Because that's how you grow, it's by testing things out, and that is something I need to get better. I'm not I'm still too afraid of silence. Wow. I I was I, I was very, very lucky to see Bill Hicks at the Royal Exchange in Manchester. Amazing. And, uh, he came on he, he, he came on at midnight and uh, I've never seen such a rant heard such a rant. Uh, but it was extraordinary work honing in on his very words and it, it was just an extraordinary comic he, he was yeah. amazing and it's and it's fascinating what you say about that because a lot of comedians do pauses and for effect and all and and all the rest of it and it all becomes part of the show and he was great at that he would like lit a, light a cigarette up and not do anything and you're waiting on his next word it, it was amazing yeah, exactly. It's that not being afraid of the silence, which he wasn't. And that yeah, takes yeah, 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 yeah. As a comic, um, you know, because you always feel judged as a comic. You always feel judged by the audience. Yeah. You feel judged by the booker. You feel judged by your peers. So to have that uh, not caring, or at least on the surface not appearing to care, that type of bravery is what makes a truly great comedian. That's brilliant. That's a great answer. Um, I've seen you live on numerous occasions mm -hmm. and I think the way you construct a set is brilliantly funny. It's so well structured. Um, please tell me about your writing process, if you've got one, and where do you get your ideas from? Uh, so it's changed. Before, I, I, I was very good when I started on the open mic. I've always been quite quick in conversations, doing crowd work, whatever. And my material was lackluster. And I just remember going, well, if you're going to do something with this, you need to be able to write. And I, and I ended up looking and I got really into joke writers, like classic joke writers. So I'm talking about people like I love Les Dawson, for example. Oh, I really love Les Dawson. Still doing with that. So one of the most naturally funny men there's ever been. Really, really love Joan Rivers. Um, who else? Uh, Rodney Dangerfield really loved. Who was the other one who I used to, who I got obsessed by? I went to see him at Edinburgh. He was amazing. Emo Phillips. Oh, he's brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely then, brilliant. I just got obsessed with the mechanics of joke writing and, you know, and how to write and how to create the perfect joke. So when I, when I had my first little 10 minute set, what it was, it was just, what I wanted to do was to make every line beautifully perfect, that you could take it out and make it quotable. That, so that was when I had my first 10 minutes set. That's what I wanted, so that every line you just could take out and you could quote it, and it would make you laugh. Um, now, the more I do it, the more, na the more talking, I talk it out now. But because I've trained myself in the how can I put it, in the structures of joke writing, in the very basics and mechanics, it now comes out more naturally in my voice. But look, here's the thing, it doesn't matter how get you, you good you get at joke writing, whatever your style may be, whatever way, whatever manner it is that you write. The reality is, is that most of us, the vast majority, I, I don't know, unless you're some kind of genius, you write 99% crap, 0.5% mediocrity, 0.3% that's, you know, good, 
and zero points, you know, two, that's, that's actually worth it if you're staying in a set. I remember gigging with uh, at, a, at a great club called the Covent Garden Comedy Club. Like, this is in the pre pandemic, back when, when it was in the gay club heaven. It was one of my favorite gigs. Just a brilliant, brilliant room for comedy. Sadly, they've moved in. I'm, I'm sure it's very good, but that room was special. Yeah. And I remember yeah. one, one comedian uh, coming off stage and getting really angry because a punter shouted out the punchline to his joke. And I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, mate, that's on you, my friend. If they can guess your punchlines, drop the joke. Drop exactly, it. yeah. Because it ain't yeah. good enough. No, no, no. When you mentioned Les Dawson, mm. Les Dawson was the first ever act I saw live. Amazing. Where did, you, where did you see him? I saw him on holiday, family holiday at Scarborough. And uh, there's, a, there's an old family story where he did, he came on at the end uh, doing an encore. Yeah. And I always say to my brother, it was grandma. And he said, no, it wasn't grandma. It was someone else near, near to grandma. He walked on and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're very privileged tonight to have the chairwoman of the Scarborough Women's Institute in the audience tonight and pointed at my grandma. Now, I had the obviously yeah. a woman. And my grandma went very red. And he went, he went, she's 111 years old today and she's been let out of the home. And she's here today. <laughs> And he started playing the piano badly, and everybody joined in with happy birthday. And halfway through, he looked to the wings and he said, what, what? Oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, she's not 111, she's ill. And the curtain... <laughs> <laughs> he was the perfect wordsmith. I'm with you, he's in my top five. He's brilliant. Definitely. I, I love this. I can yeah. watch. I remember my ex and I, like, we used to, my ex used to love comedy. And I remember once, me and her, watching Blankety Blank with, yeah. with Les Dawson. And she it's was, you know, she, yeah, she, she was younger than me. So she came from, like, she's seven, eight years younger than me. So she was, again, from another generation, really, yeah. to my generation. And we just laughed like drains at Les Dawson. Oh, I, I love I love the wordplay. I love the piano. I love Sissy and Ada. I love... Uh, Cosmo Small piece that the, the characters he created were so they were of the time, but they, they were just funny and you were laughing at it. He had a very funny face, which helped enormously. As a performer, he was sublime, yeah, absolutely, he was utterly sublime. And you look back at some of the performers, and look, comedy dates, and I'm not one of these people who looks back and then goes, Oh, we need to get rid of these things are made and they are of their time. I think yeah, we yeah. need to appreciate that. We need to understand that with everything, right? And what we find unacceptable now, back then, it was a different world, a different time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you look back at some of those other comedians, you go, oh, this is dated, this is a bit whatever. This... And his stuff is so fresh. Even his mother-in-law jokes, they still make me laugh. <laughs> I remember like, his mother-in-law jokes and, like, and just my ex just laughing her head off. Just brilliant. He was superb. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you can also tell as well there was there wasn't there was no malice in what he was doing. I always found it very exactly. interesting that actually he had a wonderful relationship with his mother in law. They were incredibly close in real life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other the other the other time I saw him, he was he the, the, just before he died, he was in um he was in a play called Run for Your Wife, a, a not very good Ray Cooney farce. And everybody around him uh, was like ordinary actors, and he just blew everybody off the stage. He was hilarious. He did ten minutes of stand-up before he went on, and there was myself, my then girlfriend, and a woman with a baby in the audience, and the baby was crying. And he jumped down off the set, stopped the play, looked to the baby, and went, "I don't want low. I want smile." And the baby stopped crying, and when yeah. I, when when I met, um, I met his wife because they did a book uh, review mm. and uh, I told her the story and she said that was Les. He was a wonderful, funny, lovely bloke. He was, he was just yeah. genuine. Thoughts. Anyway, let's move on. I could talk all night about Les Dawson. <laughs> so did I. Let's, yeah. let's move on to Edinburgh. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to go to it, be able to go to Edinburgh every year for my holiday. And I go for a week 
and I see about 50 shows in a week and I'm exhausted by the end of it, but I need to know I'm going to come back. Um, tell me what your first Edinburgh Fringe was like and what did you think of it? My first Edinburgh Fringe, I went in, I was at uni and then I did a production of Macbeth. Uh, right. I was playing Macduff and it got a solid three stars in every publication. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> there you go. Three stars. Wow. Well, well done. Well done. Yeah. yeah. That's Three brilliant. stars, what, yeah. What, yeah. What year was that? That was 2001. 2001. So when did you go up with comedy? I went up with comedy in 2010. I did a show called Topless Comedy, right? And here's the thing. Uh, it's not a good. It's not a good story, Rich. It's. Uh, <laughs> Please feel free. <laughs> it's not a good story. So there was a guy. There was a nice fella called Mr. Stillers, and uh, he was a tabloid journalist. All oh, right. And he thought that the way to get people in was to call it topless comedy. It was called it A A A R G A. So Ah, it's topless comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so we were first in the brochure, right? Yes. And he was a morbidly obese man. And uh, his act was to get women to come on stage, punch him in the no. stomach, and then he had a picture of Peter Andre, and they would punch that with his six-pack, and they would then judge who has the strongest six-pack. Wow. Yeah. And he that was the headliner. Odd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> and I mean, we had the worst people in the open mic so what would happen really? i was the mc i would go on an mc and you know i was an open mic mc but i was fairly competent at the job get people <laughs> in a good mood chat with them bring the first act on the guy called ian baker a very good comedian open mic comedian at the time and he would do really well then we'd get another lady on called josephine lacy who was who is great still going now Love Joseph. Yeah, yeah. And, then it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then it rapidly, like a roller coaster, just. <laughs> that's what was the art. People are like, this is going to be a good show. And anyway, <laughs> and people were there just horrified, man. And then, yeah, and then Stillers would come out at the end, get someone to punch him. The highlight for me is when he brought out this woman, right, from the audience. And then went to him, can you punch me in the stomach? And she went, I'm sorry, I don't want to touch you. <laughs> that is a horrible story. <laughs> it is. It is. There were so many moments in it which were, you know, it, it was just a bizarre time. Then we got a couple of people. Uh, it got video um, because one of the guys, who's actually a good comedian, actually a musical comedian, can't remember his name. He was doing this reality TV show, so we had Greg from The Apprentice come in. I remember we had once these these three Italian lads come in, right? And they sat down. They couldn't speak a word of English. And at the end, one of them came up to me and went, when is the topless going to happen? So they... <laughs> that's brilliant. That, and, that's... As a comp <laughs> and as a compare, at the end, I would say after every gig, when the audience was sitting there shell shocked at what a disastrously shit show it had been, I said, "Well, <laughs> thank you for coming to Topless Comedy, the only free show that still leaves you shortchanged." <laughs> that that is on a par with my one and only time I became a stand-up comedian, which was at the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, I. Um, uh, said to my mates in the pub, I said, I think I could be a stand up comedian and never yeah. said, never, never again. I might have another go. But um, I got on a show which was, um, it was a uh, Monday afternoon in Haymarket. It was full of old people. There was about five people in there. It was a gong show. Mm -hmm. and, they, and the promoter said, Go on, then you've got three minutes. And I wrote a script about me crashing cars in Carlisle. And I, thought, <laughs> and I thought, this is great. This is really good. And I walked out. And the first thing I said to them was, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Many people think I look like the skier, Eddie the Eagle Edwards, but I can't see the resemblance myself. And at the time, I was his double, right? Mm -hmm. And an old bloke in the back just went, fuck off, and gonged me off to my own footstep. <laughs> and the, the promoter said, have another go. There's another one at tea time. So I walked out, similar thing happened. And I thought, never again. But I think the sp my place in the comedy world is in the audience supporting all the comedians. But I'll be uh, honest with you, I'll be honest with you, Rich. I think there's dignity to that, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> it was it was an experience to behold. <laughs> anyway, uh, to date, what has been your comedy highlight? My comedy highlight. Oh, there's a question. So I've opened, I've opened for a few people on tour. That was fun. Paul Sinner, Paul Chowdhury, uh, who uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Eddie Izzard. I tell you what, awesome, pretty bad, eh? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Is um, I came so I opened for Eddie and Barcelona Madrid, and I, I performed comedy in Spanish. Um, wow, which was which was great. I'm doing it all in Spanish because Spanish is my second language because of my mum because my mum's. Latin American, and um, That's great. and then I remember uh, I was at the Angel Comedy Club where I used to work, and Eddie said to me to come back and meet his mates, and we hung out and had a drink and whatever. And he said to his mates, to his friends, "This guy's a very funny comedian. He's got this brilliant joke about Brexit, about and then because my mum is Latin American, but she voted Brexit." And I used to have this whole bit about her, like, uh, it's, it's on, it's on all the, the social, people want to find it, they can. Yeah. And, um, uh, and he said, it's just a brilliant joke. It's so, so funny. And that to me was like, you know, someone like a Ronaldo saying you're a great footballer. Oh, I mean, he is spot on. I was, yeah. at, uh, I went, I went to the, uh, there was a memorial concert for jeremy hardy and Izzard appeared and he was just he did 10 minutes of just superb again wordplay comedy he was just mm. fantastic um how do you cope with any difficult audiences do you have a mechanism or does it just is it just dependent on the night or well, look, the is there a way to deal with the, them or? the more look, i've done I don't do as much stand-up now because of my show, no. because that takes up my time. So I do one or two gigs a week still, and I do mainly new material. But when I was doing the circuit, after a while, like, you know, like I, put, I used to play headliners, top secret. The only one I didn't do was the store because I was still, I hadn't got around to applying for that. But I did all the other clubs, the other big clubs. And after a while, you understand what type of, it's not being a teacher. You look at this class and you go, and after 10 years of teaching, you go, right, they're this type of class. You know? <laughs> you just go, they're this type of audience. Yeah, and you yeah. just know that you might have a brilliant joke about, you know, you know, the, you know, the political situation of the moment, but it's not going to be for them. You know, so you just get to understand what type of audience it is. You get up and you go, okay, they're an MC audience. All they want is for you to banter with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, it, and it's, it's still very good it. at. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 that's you. You start to understand what type of audience, what an audience wants. And when you, as a comedian, start to leave the circuit because you've got your own audience, what that is is a group of people who like what you do. Sure. Because. You know, if, I, I was, I was, I think I was listening to an interview with Jim Jeffries and even Doug Stanhope, and they're both magnificent comedians. And Doug Stanhope himself said, "Look, if I did what I do in my shows to a club night, I'll die. I'll yeah, die. Yeah. They just, they just won't go for it. They will because it's so uniquely me. And and I think that's the point. You know, you've got to understand that a lot of the time when you die, you know." Sometimes when you start out, it's your fault and whatever else, but there's a lot of the time it's a misbooking, but it's just a wrong act for the night. If you've got someone who's doing brilliant, incisive political satire, and they're a pissed up group on a, on a Saturday night who just want to go out and have a bit of a, you know, a good time and they want easy, yeah, yeah. accessible, hard-hitting jokes, and it doesn't work, 
that's no one's fault. It's like going on a date and just realizing you don't fancy each other. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's and fascinating. I always say to, and I always say to people, like, when, you know, it's particularly in younger, newer acts, because I used to teach comedy. I used to teach a comedy course. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, Angel, I used to be around a lot of younger comics. They'd come and they'd talk to me and they'd go, oh, you know, it, it didn't work and why, why, why is that? And I, and, I, and I used to say to them, like, you know, you can be the juiciest, freshest peach on the tree, but if someone wants a Donna Kebab, <laughs> you know, <That's> okay. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And you can take it personally, of course you take it, but you know, obviously there's things you could have done, but I, I think it's, you know, once you've done it for long enough, there comes a certain realization and maturity, and it just happens to the best comedians. You're not going to be able yeah, to play yeah. every room. Not every audience is right for you, and that's fine. That's so, that's, fine. that's such a good answer, such a an honest answer, and such a good answer as well. Because with live comedy, I'm just I'm just moving on to online gigs as opposed to live mm -hmm. gigs. Certainly with with live comedy, you're in the moment. And that's the magic of it. With it being live, anything can happen in that room. Yeah. Whereas with online comedy, it's nowhere near as spontaneous. Spontaneous, spontaneity. If it well, spontaneous. spontaneous that's the word, yeah. yeah. Um, as live comedy, because there's a break in the internet or whatever yeah. it is. It's great that it's there. What's your view of online comedy as opposed to live comedy? Do you do many online gigs? Uh, I do online. I, like, I do the occasional online gig. Uh, like I, I open for Jeff Norcott a lot. I love Jeff. I think he's, he's a phenomenal brilliant. comedian. Uh, he's yeah. also a great bloke. We, I, I have a good time with him. Uh, it's weird, like, the parallels in, my, in our lives. Like, we, we grew up around the corner from each other. Our dads used to work yeah. together. We both well, had a parent who's disabled. Um, we we both come from like this, the exact same part of South London. That's I went amazing. to one comp, co, uh, I went to one comp in Wimbledon. He went to the other one. Um, so yeah, but I, I really like Jeff. And um, yeah. so what, what were we talking about online? So I do a lot of I do some of Jeff's online gigs because he's got a patron and yeah know, yeah, and, and he's also got an audience who are more politically engaged so i feel like i can do stuff that i, I, I want to do i think like someone made this point to me about online gigs when when people were were, were saying they were crap and you know and, you know then it's not as good let's be fair it's a method done to the heroin of stand-up comedy let's just put it like that yeah, yeah. Someone said, but I, I saw a comment from someone on facebook who went well i'm disabled and i'm and i'm housebound and i can't go out so this for me is as good as doing a stand is as live comedy. This is as close as I'm gonna get. And that made I'd me say think like right. Yeah, that made me think actually, you know what? Like is it as good as live? No, it's not. But for other people who for whatever reason maybe they can't get to a gig, maybe they're shielded, maybe they're disabled, maybe mm. whatever it may be, maybe they're skin. I, I think it's, a, it's it's an alternative. It's not as good, but it's a viable alternative for those people. I totally agree. When it when it first started, I I uh, I, I don't think I would have survived lockdown without it because um, I, w I would go to the Happy Mondays uh, online night with Sean James. I would go to Always Be Comedy with James Gill, and I'd go to uh, Return of the Crack with Gareth Regan. And when they all first started off, they, there was no audio at all. Yeah. Uh, and so I was sitting there laughing at four walls mm. and I thought I was going to be taken away but but when they opened it up um, and yeah. the, the, they could that they could banter with the front row and the comedians yeah. could find the jokes better and when it's done well it's done really well yeah. but obviously um with us coming back to hopefully some sort of normality now it's so much better that we're back in live comedy environments because you miss it, and uh, the comedy world has taken such a battering. It's been awful, you know, the arts in general, and it's great that they're trying to bring it all back. Yeah, and look, you know, it kept a lot of comedians going through the pandemic. It mm. kept a lot of people going. So on, on my mm. show, um, Trigonometry, we do, we used to, do, we still do roars, which are live streams, and what it is. It's an hour and a half irreverent look at the, the news and things that are happening in political commentary. And uh, 
we started really as a way to stay sane. Well, we started we started doing one a week and then we wrapped up to four a week during the pandemic. It's a way to stay sane, give us something to do. Yeah. And I was just getting messages from people going, you're, you're keeping me sane. Yeah, it's exactly you know, that. You know, and you, you got, and people say, you know, coming up to me saying, thank you, you, you've kept me going through the pandemic. Which, you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely thing to say, but if I'm the yeah. thing keeping you going in the pandemic, mate, you're fucked. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Very so, true. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, hopefully live gigs will be back to normal as quickly as we can hope. Um, who are your favourite Canadians, past and present? Uh, my favourite comedians, uh, for different reasons, Emo Phillips for joke writing, uh, Joe Rivers for her beautifully absurd, brilliant, uh, finely crafted jokes, just She's incredibly quotable, quotable. Les Dawson for his grumpy sense of playfulness and the character and the way that he does, you know, and the way that he used music in order to create but th this character in this entire world that he live in. Uh, now I love Bill Burr. I think he's a phenomenal comedian. Oh, superb. Yeah, superb. So mm -hmm. um, who else? I, I love Dave Chappelle. Um, yeah. Patrice O'Neill is certainly no longer with us. He was another one who was, who was incredible. Good call. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, th those for me are, are the ones that I find that I think are great. In, in terms of British comics, I really, really love watching. Um, I love uh, Finn Taylor's great. I, re I really yeah. enjoy Sean Walsh. Brilliant oh, comic. Great. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot. Steve Hughes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, I went to see Jerry Sadowitz at the Leicester Square Theatre. Oh, I saw him at Edinburgh. He's fantastic. He's so yeah. good. <laughs> he's, I mean, Some he's on the front of Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. I remember he got his, uh, let's just say, he got his wang out uh, 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 in front of us, waved it what about. What he's wand. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, and he, he said, I get it out at every gig. At this point, it's now become a contractual obligation. <laughs> yeah, super. Brilliant. Brilliant. Just, following on, just following on from that, like me, do you go to a lot of gigs as a member of the audience? I would like to go to more, but um, so like uh, when when the Leicester Square Theatre opened up, I went to like I went to watch Finn, I went to watch Steve Hughes, yeah. I went to watch um, Jerry. So I, I, yeah, I really enjoy stand up. I love stand up. I love it as an art form. I used to run the yeah. new material, new at new material nights on a Sunday at Angel Comedy. I used to love watching, you know, the new comedians. I used to love comedians when they were testing out new stuff. I love the art form. So, yeah, I do. I don't get to go as much because I'm, I'm really busy. But my girlfriend is really, really into comedy now. And she adores it and she watches it. And, you know, and she sometimes goes to me like, you know, if I want to go with her to watch a gig, she lives uh, downstairs at the King's Head. And I'd love to go. You know, I can't go because of my other thing, because I've got commitments. But if I had a free Saturday, I'd happily go and watch downstairs at yeah, the King's yeah. Head. Or, you can't beat it Lon no. london i'm i'm so privileged to live in london because mm. it's you can go to a comedy night every night it's mm. it's it's extraordinary and it's so good that comedy is expanding right throughout britain yeah you know i can i can, I can go home to carlisle and there's comedy there as well now so it's it's brilliant it's, it's brilliant it's brilliant you know, reason, and it's, go for it yeah Rich. Yeah, I was, I was, I was just going to say the reason why uh, I asked both those questions is that there's a section in my blog called "The Ones That Got Away," and I've written about 25 comedians who have either passed on or haven't had a chance to see. And I would love to have seen the likes of Bob Monkhouse or um, Norman Wisdom or Frankie Howard or. Um, uh, I, I'd love to go and see Ross Noble. I've never had a chance to see him yet. Now, here he's fantastic live. Mm. These, these comedians who can just say one word and fly are, mm. are amazing. Absolutely incredible. And, and, and the other good thing about the blog is watching the comedians develop. 
so it's so, so it's like a never-ending list of whenever i go to the gig mm. and i've seen so many popular comedians now starting out and it's wonderful watching their journeys yeah yeah it is it's great and you see them flourish and you see them going yeah. in the right directions yeah. if, yeah, so. if, if you're on a comedy bill do you stay and watch all the comedians yeah, I do invariably. Yeah. I, I, I like to. Right. I like to. It, it depends. Like, there's comedians who I will always stay and watch. We, it's someone like Jeff Innocent. I love Jeff. I think he's, oh, a, he's a phenomenal man. Um, yeah. So I always stay and watch Jeff. And, and uh, who else? Who else? I like. I used to always stay and watch Ian Stone whenever I gig with him. Yeah. Ian's brilliant. You know, yeah. Adam Bloom. Adam yeah. is incredible. Uh, you know, uh, so there's lots of people that I would stay and watch and have and, and just see because it was always a it was always a privilege. That's and even brilliant. though I, I'd seen them numerous times, just to see them the way they handled the room, what they did with the room. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. Great. It, it is it is fascinating how each mm. of them control the audience when they come on. It's I I, I I'm fascinated with that. Um I've so much enjoyed talking to you. You've been an absolutely fantastic guest. Thank you so much. No, it's a pleasure, Rich. I've enjoyed it as well, mate. Just, just, before, just before we go, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, do you want to promote your podcast? Do you want to um, tell people where you are on social media or anything like that? Yeah, you can follow me at Francis J. Foster. My podcast is called Trigonometry. We've interviewed several comedians on there. We've interviewed Simon Evans. Uh, we've interviewed David Baddiel. It's not a comedy yeah. podcast. It's a, a social political commentary podcast, I would say. But we've interviewed David Baddiel, Simon Evans, Jeff Norcott, Andrew Doyle, um, really? lots of people. So if you're interested with people talking about comedy, but more of a cerebral, social, political kind of context, so I'd really advise you to check it out. Plus, we've interviewed everyone, economists, uh, right the way across the political spectrum everyone from uh the co-founder of extinction rebellion right the way through to nigel farage so if you're wow. interested in that check it out fantastic well my friend i'm looking forward to seeing you live again very very soon yeah and all the very best to you and thank you so much for your time no pleasure rich it's been it's been joy thanks mate all the best cheers bye-bye